Hey, thank you so much. All right, awesome. So excited to be hanging out with you guys here today. Thanks to Pastor Jeff. That was an incredible intro and completely true story. That was crazy. He's like, are you a magician? I was like, are you messing with me? That was insane. Uh, but I want to make you guys a part of the service. We're going to do a little audience participation. Is that okay? That was like 20% of you guys. The rest of you, as soon as I say audience participation and I saw it happen just now, a whole bunch of people break eye contact with me. They're like, please don't pick me. Uh, which is really funny. I'm always entertained by that. You guys know, even if you don't look at me, I can still see you. You know that, right? That's how that works. I want to try something everyone here can participate in. Everybody take their hands, put them out in front of you like this. We'll try to get this, get you guys warmed up. All right, hands out in front. Everybody, hands out in front. Hands out in front. Everybody, come on. Come on, do it. I'm not going to take your wallets. All right, I promise it's safe. All right, step number one goes like this. Take your hands, put your hands together, stretch your fingers out really well. Stretch them out. Holy cow, did you guys hear that? I've been saying this at the other services. Everywhere I go, it's always like one person I hear across the room, like thousands of fingers are cracking. Basically, you sound really stressed out here in Chula Vista is what it sounds like. So as soon as you're stretched out really well, put your hands out in front of you again. This is going to be weird, but we're going somewhere, I promise. Thumbs up like this. Take your thumbs that are facing up, turn them down on the inside like this. Backs of your hands together. Looks good. Take one arm, cross it over the other. That's where things get a little more complicated. See if you can take your hands and lock your fingers back together. Squeeze them together really tight. Do not let go. Keep your thumbs down. Thumbs down. Hold that right there. Just going to scan the crowd real quick. Want to make sure everyone's actually participating. Got a dude back there in the back, plaid shirt, not participating. <laughs> He's just, you're not even going to do it. Okay. He's like, I'm too cool for this. Don't mess with me. All right. Uh, everybody else looks good. Looks good. Bonus points if you can wiggle only your pinkies at the same time. It's difficult, but hard. All right, final step goes like this. Here we go. Watch, follow along. All right, thumbs up. Give it a little twist. No? Some of you? Most of you know. All right, maybe not. Everybody do this. Everybody do this. You guys are catching on. You're catching on. All right, some of you right now know what you're thinking. You're like, that was insane. What just happened? How did you do that? Some of you are thinking like, Really? They flew a guy in all the way from Nashville to show us something lame like that? Uh, and it's a really simple trick. Maybe some of you figured it out, and that's totally okay. It's not really why I'm here. I'm not here to like fool one or like get you with a magic trick. That's not what magic's about, even though that's what a lot of people think. Uh, but it is interesting how easy it is to be deceived. Like when I was a kid, someone in my school knew I was fascinated by magic tricks and came up and explained that trick to me. Did not perform it, just explained it. Hey, Harris, do you know if you walk up to someone and do this and this with their hands, the person watching, they'll have no idea how to get their thumbs facing up. And I was like... No, no one is ever going to fall for something that simple. I went and tried it for someone like you guys. They were like, how did you do that? And I was like, it is really easy for people to be tricked and deceived. And what I've now discovered after spending literally the last 20 years of my life traveling around the world doing magic shows, it is easy for us to be deceived. Not because you guys aren't smart. You're intelligent human beings. It's just that most people have never studied subjects like trickery or deception or things like that, which makes it possible for magicians and illusionists to deceive you. Um, and I know it's going to be way more fun if I don't just talk about that, but if I actually show you guys what I'm talking about. So let me explain. A little over 10 years ago, I was on this tour in Southeast Asia. I was performing in two countries on this particular tour, India and Sri Lanka, which is a little island off the southern coast of India. In Sri Lanka, we performed an illusion with an old antique table, very similar to this one up here on stage. After the show, this guy comes up to us and he's super fascinated by this table. He kept asking us questions like, where did you get that table? Come to find out, according to him, he had seen this table before. He goes on to explain to us that down the street from where he lives, there's a man in his village there in Sri Lanka who apparently has a table and looks exactly like mine. He thought, clearly you borrowed it from this man because it's the exact same table. He goes on to explain that the guy who had the table claimed it could move around. He said the table could actually slide across the floor without anyone touching it. And apparently that was possible, he said, because of spirits or something like that, that they were manifesting their presence by making the table move. Honestly, I was skeptical. I wasn't sure what to believe. So I decided, let's just go visit this man with this mysterious table and do a little bit of research. And what I discovered that day shocked me and taught me a lesson that I will never forget. Before I tell you what that was, I want to perform for you the same illusion I did for people in Sri Lanka. To do that, I need some more help from the audience. I actually want to get one of you up here on stage this time to help out. If you'd like to help out, please raise your hand. Do we have any volunteers? There's a young lady right down there on the front, a kid in the big service. That's awesome. Come on up. Everybody clap for her. Give her a big round of applause for volunteering. Make your way. There's some steps all the way over here. Appreciate you volunteering. Got a big, beautiful smile on your face. Hi, I'm Harris. What's your name? Emily. Emily, very nice to meet you, Emily. How old are you? Um, 11. 11. Are you serious? Emily, that is exactly how old I was when I was your age. 
You don't believe me. Okay, all right, step over here on this side of the stage. I'm gonna put the table right up here in between you and I. Emily, turn around and face me. Take a few steps back that way just a little bit, a little bit more. All right, now come back towards me just a little bit. Right over that trap door, Emily. I'm just messing with you. There's nothing down there. Any trap doors down there on the stage? No? Is there any weird things above your head in the air? Any strings or anything like that you can see? Are there any weird gadgets on my hands or anything other than my wedding? There's a tablecloth draped across the top of the table. In a moment, I'm going to need you to help me hang onto the corners of the tablecloth. You're up on stage right now to do two things. One, hold the tablecloth, but two, to ensure to them that what they are experiencing out there is exactly what they would be experiencing if they were way up here, inches away from this table where you are, okay? What I need you to do is hold on to the corners of the tablecloth, one in each hand. I'm gonna do the same thing on my side. No matter what happens, Emily, do not hold this table down. Like, don't put any downward pressure on the table with your hands, don't hold it down with the tablecloth. Just hold the corners lightly like this, kind of with plenty of slack. If this works, if the table decides to move, I just need you to move with the table, okay? Okay. Lift up the tablecloth so you can see the table underneath. Lift it up really high, really high. Whoa. All right, let go, let go, let go. Let go. Stay right there. Hey, let's give Emily a big round of applause for volunteering. Thank you very much, Emily. You may go back to your seat. Uh, almost missed it. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Emily. You can do better than that. Give it up for her. Well done. Well done. Great job. Great job. All right. I don't want anybody to leave here confused. We don't need pastor emails and stuff going like, dude, they had a sorcerer doing wizardry. <laughs> there was a witch at church this morning, like it was crazy. We don't need that kind of word spreading around. So I wanna be really clear, but before I explain, quick little audience survey, how many of you just saw a table levitating right here on this stage with your own eyes? Anyone? That's weird, right? Like, because I'll be honest with you, like deep down, you guys know that I'm an illusionist, which means that table was not actually levitating, right? Like, I promise you that's not a power I have. You're not seeing like genuine supernatural acts here on stage this morning. This isn't sorcery or witchcraft. This is really no different than the tricks you would see in a movie theater when you watch a building blow up using special effects. I've just gone to the effort of learning how to use psychology and sensory deception and misdirection and sleight of hand to create the illusion of something actually happening. And when you understand the principles of how deception works, you can create a belief believable illusion so that people who don't understand those principles of deception can sort of misperceive reality, that your senses would be led to misperceive what's actually happening and your senses would convince your brain, I think I'm seeing a table levitate right in front of my face, right? This was a really simple trick that I could explain to everyone here this morning in about five minutes or less. I won't obviously, right? But I could. The reason I want is it would ruin all the fun. It's that wonder that makes magic so magical. And that's what we're going to talk about here this morning. But I also need to explain that even if I told you the secret, it wouldn't give you the ability to go out and perform it. This is a natural ability that anyone can do. But just knowing the secret to a magic trick, even though it's simple to understand, it's difficult to execute. So it wouldn't give you the ability to do it. Like you knowing how a magic trick works doesn't make you a magician any more than going to a music store and buying a guitar or a drum kit makes you a musician, right? It takes hours of practice invested into it. That means that this illusion actually took me about six months, six months of really hard practice and work almost every single day to learn how to create the appearance of a table levitating so that people would convince themselves that that's what they're actually seeing. Now, what about the story I told you about Sri Lanka? It's a true story. In Sri Lanka, there really was a guy who really did have a table, looked exactly like mine. The part about him communicating with spirits and all that stuff, big fat lie. He was doing nothing supernatural. I believe in the supernatural, but this guy was doing nothing supernatural in any way whatsoever. People hear me tell that story all the time and they think, but how do you know for sure? 
because I went to visit the guy, talked to him, found out that he got his table from the same place I got mine. He ordered it from a magic trick catalog from the state of Kansas all the way from the United States of America. <laughs> this guy was doing a magic trick to deceive thousands of people in his country and get them to believe the lies that he was telling. Why did they fall for his lies? That's what I asked when I was flying across the ocean back home to America. Why did so many people fall for this guy's lie? And then it hit me that the principles of deception were universal. That the same way that people like me trick people like you in the context of a magic show are the exact same ways that people trick all of us into believing all sorts of things that aren't true. Sometimes we call those people magicians and illusionists. Sometimes we joke around, we call them politicians, right? A lot of times we call them marketers and advertisers. Did you guys know that here in America, you and I, especially during the holiday season, we actually take in about four to 5,000 5, messages and advertisements every single day, trying to shift your perspective and get you to see the world and yourself in that world a certain way for the sake of guiding your choices and actions that you take. And it happens. We allow ourselves to take our eyes off the thing that is truly magical, the truth of who Christ is in us and who we are in him, we take our eyes off of God and we shift it and we, we end up settling for these illusions. Like you and I, instead of living a truly magical life, we settle for these like sort of fake counterfeit illusions, these, these counterfeit versions of life offered to us by the world. And what I would like to argue here this morning is that wonder, if that wonder would be reawakened, if you could stop and pause and experience childlike wonder, it would change your perspective and how you see everything in the world around you. Because you see, I think wonder is like this. It's like a little switch, right? And it's like a light switch on a wall. And we're born with that switch turned on. When you're a little kid, you see possibility and magic everywhere. And then somewhere along the way, you start growing up and someone wounds you. It's a bully on a playground or a father figure. Something says, because everything in this world is conspiring against wonder. Everything in this world needs you to settle for the status quo. That means it needs to shut down wonder. And then we get wounded and that little switch gets flipped off. And it gives birth to cynicism and hopelessness. And then we start using our imaginations to like worry and fear. Like when I was a little kid, I used to think that we use our imaginations and then we grow up and we stop using them. What I've discovered is that you use your imagination every single day, just instead of using it to dream about the life that God might have for you or to create or innovate, you imagine all of the horrible things that could potentially go wrong. You use your imagination to fear and worry. But what if worry is a misuse of your imagination? What if it was meant to be used for so much more? Let me explain and show you what I mean. Let's do is try something with you involving our imaginations. I need a volunteer from the audience. Um, here's what I need. There's two qualifications. One, it's helpful if you know all the names in a deck of cards, all 52 names. Uh, it's ace through king, two through 10, jack, queen, king. Um, and there are four suits, just so you guys know, hearts, diamonds, spades, and clubs, all right? They are not clovers, they are not puppy feet, okay, people? They are clubs, all right? The second qualification is simple. You just need to have a good, vivid imagination. If you believe you have a good imagination, you know the names of the cards, please raise your hand. All right, you don't even have to come up on stage. You can stay right where you are. This gentleman right here at the end of the aisle in the glasses, would you mind standing up for me? Is that okay? What is your name? Pedro. What is it? Pedro. Pedro. How would you rate your imagination on a scale of one to 10? Eight. An eight. Okay, all right, all right, we'll see how this goes. I'm gonna take the cards, I'm gonna put them back here, back on the table, okay, Pedro? You raised your hand, so I'm gonna trust you. We're gonna use this deck of cards. They're invisible. Can you see them here in my hands? Yes. <laughs> this is one of our great, Pedro. All right, I'm gonna take the cards. I'm gonna take this whole deck of cards right here, I'm just gonna take it and toss it out there to you. Okay, good catch, all right, that was good. <laughs> Good thing I threw them in slow motion. You would have missed. All right, take, Pedro, take those cards. I need you to shuffle them up. All right, mix them up really well. Pedro, Pedro you got to take them out of the box first. Right? <laughs> there we go. All right, cool. Shuffle them up, mix them up. Now fan them out in front of your face. They're all different. They're all mixed up. I need you to choose a card. Before you pick one, though, let me give you a tip. I need you to help me make this as amazing as possible. You can do that by choosing a card that no one else would think of. Like if you choose like a really valuable card, like a face card, queen or king or an ace, Another example would be a three because it's a really popular number. I mean, you can think of a three if you really want to. It's a free choice. But I'm saying a lot of people would pick a card like those cards. This would be more amazing if you pick a card random in the middle of the deck that you think no one else would think of. Don't say it out loud, but reach inside your deck, pull it out, look at it. Memorize the name of it. Show it to your friends so they know which one it is. 
Now we know who the crazies are. <laughs> take the card, turn it face down, put it back inside the deck. Close the cards back up, shuffle it back in. You're going to take the cards, throw them all the way back up here to me on the stage after you put them back in the box first. <laughs> yeah, take your time. Just throw them back up here to me. Just, Mind-blowing stuff in church today, isn't it? It's amazing. We're going to leave the world of Pedro's very interesting imagination. We're going to enter back into the world of reality with this same deck of cards that we had just a moment ago. What if what we imagined with our minds could actually be real? Pedro, I've got the cards out on display. That way everyone can see them. That way they're fairly seen so I can't cheat. Just to make sure Pedro can't cheat, I'm going to make you name your card out loud so that in a moment you can't claim Nope, that wasn't my card. Pedro, for the first time out loud, what was the name of the card that you turned over in your imagination? The Four of Clubs. <clears throat> That's not the card we talked about outside earlier <laughs> in the parking lot when you pulled up in your... Okay, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Just to make it really clear, I want to make this really clear. We've never set this up, right? I didn't talk to you before the service. No one came up to you and was like, just say this card. This was not set up or prearranged. Pedro, you and I, we have never even met before. Is that correct? <laughs> You look pretty happy about that. That's all right. <laughs> the four of clubs. What I haven't told you is earlier I was backstage. I had this deck of cards out. I was going through the cards one by one, practicing an entirely different trick. There was one single card that kept standing out to me. So I took that card out of this deck. I put it back inside and I shuffled it. Pedro, how crazy would it be if the card that I turned over in this real deck of cards was the exact same card that you turned over in your mind? I think so too. You said the one that you pulled out was the four of Four of clubs, that's amazing. I'm gonna go through the entire deck one by one just so you guys can see that out of all these cards, there is a single card turned upside down. Four of clubs, that's incredible. The four of clubs. Everybody give Pedro a big round of applause. Thanks very much, Pedro, you may be seated. Well done, well done. Okay. Now, any questions? <laughs> hey, what are you guys thinking right now? Go ahead and say it out loud. What are you thinking? <laughs> yeah, okay. Like, most people are like, how, right? Like, how did you do that? Look, listen, earlier I was backstage and uh, I was like peeking through. And as soon as James was like, we have an illusionist. He's basically a magician. As I could see around the corner, I saw especially some of the gentlemen, they were like, Magician, huh? They like cross their arms and adjust themselves in their seat. And then as I walked out, you started leaning in and you're like, all right, Mr. Magician, let's see if you can fool me, right? And you view these things that I'm doing as like these puzzles to be solved because in 2017, unlike the magicians of yesteryear when they talk about how audiences reacted to their magic at the turn of the century where it was just awe and wonder and you were comfortable with that idea, in 2017, instead of just saying, wow, you guys watch magicians and you just want to know, how, right? And what's ironic is that's how we view God. That's how you live your life on a daily basis. You, you just kind of go through your life going, how? I wonder how that works. How does that work? How is that going to be possible? There's no way. How could God do that? How is that dream going to actually become reality? And I think it's partly because we all have these, like these seemingly magical devices that we carry around our pockets, right? Like we have these little supercomputers. And these things give you access to the answer to anything, which has actually created this entire generation and culture of people who are really uncomfortable with the idea of mystery. I mean, if you can look up how something works on Wikipedia or YouTube or Google, you don't have to be in awe of anything anymore because you can just look up the secret and then go, oh, that's how it works. And ironically, that idea has transitioned or transformed our belief and faith in God. We don't have to have as much faith in something unless it can be proved to us. Like we want physical evidence. And then that way it gives us the faith and the ability and the proof we need in order to believe. But what if you actually stopped and believed and had the worldview that you had when you were a little kid? Remember when you were a little kid? Anything was possible, right? And like now we grow up, we become parents and we tell our kids that, hey, honey, any, anything is possible. You just got to believe, right? Like anything is possible. And we say that as parents, but then you live as if it's not true. You see, I love doing that trick because as soon as I pull something invisible out, I get a glimpse of everyone in the room and everyone looks at me like I'm crazy and out of my mind, right? Hey, look, and it's an invisible deck of cards. And you guys are like, right, okay, that's awesome, yeah. Um, but if I pull out an invisible deck of cards in a room full of little kids, do they have a problem with that? No, because their imaginations are still fine. Like, that is a comfortable idea. Yeah, let's imagine. An invisible deck of cards? Okay, oh, you want me to catch it? That's great. 
Adults, <laughs> oh, that's funny. Oh, I forgot to take it by the box first. That's a good one, Harris. Like, well done, right? And that cynicism pushes back against this idea of embracing our imagination because it whispers in our ears and it lies and says, hey, don't do that. You're being childish right now. You need to grow up. Stop acting like that. And it's easy to believe these sort of things, right? Because after all, that's, that's much of what the Bible teaches. Like my favorite book of the Bible is James. And, and James is always like, like, hey, grow up, be mature in your faith. Um, even in 1 Corinthians, it says very specifically like, hey, you need to put away childish things. Paul says, when I was a child, I acted like a child. And then when I grew up and became an adult, like I put away childish things. I, I left that part of me behind. But what's weird is Jesus... Um, says otherwise. And I don't think there's a conflict. So let me explain. But first, I want to read you what Jesus actually said. It's in Matthew 18. Uh, before leading up to chapter 18, Jesus is walking around. He's doing his ministry. Um, and he's doing all these incredible things, like genuine miracles, because he is not just man. He is also fully God, right? So people are experiencing genuine magic, the supernatural, right? And when they're experiencing this, they're blown away by it. And then by the time we get to chapter 18, he's hanging out with the disciples and they ask him this question. Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, that might seem like a silly question at the surface. I agree. It's, it's not surprising coming from a group of dudes, right? Like, hey, Jesus, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And maybe they ask this thinking that Jesus might say, well, it's Peter or it's John. Like, it's one of you guys. Yeah, it's pretty cool, isn't it? Uh, but that's not what happens. It, what I imagine, it's very short, but I, what I imagine is Jesus kind of pausing and going, <laughs> face palm, right? Like, he's the greatest. You know what? This is a good teaching opportunity. And the Bible says he motions over a little kid. And listen to what he says. At the time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And this is Jesus. And calling to him a child, Jesus puts that child in the midst of them. Maybe they're all sitting in a circle. And then Jesus says this. Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus? Oh, guys, okay, hold on a second. Hey, kid, come over here, come over here. Grabs this little kid by the hand, puts him in the middle circle. This. This little kid is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And then he explains it all and almost makes it offensive to a group of adults. He says, unless you even have the mind of this child, you're never even gonna enter the kingdom of God. That didn't make sense to me until I eventually became a father on my own because I started becoming cynical the more I became an adult. When that wonder switch got flipped to the off position, my imagination stopped being used to create and it started being used to worry. When wonder was shut down, I became cynical and things looked hopeless and strangely dim and I wasn't able to place my childlike faith in a God with whom I could really believe that anything was possible. But you see, if Paul is saying, put away childish things, if James is saying, grow up, if we have all these New Testament writers saying, be an adult, be mature in your faith, and Jesus is saying, be like a little kid, where's the tension? And what I discovered is this, and this is what I hope that you leave with this morning more than anything else, is that there is a huge difference between being childish and being childlike. There's a difference between you acting like a little kid and throwing tempton trandoms and worrying because everything feels like it's out of control and not trusting your heavenly father. There's a difference between that and you being, I'm gonna be like childlike. I'm gonna place my trust in my heavenly father and truly believe and imagine that anything might be possible. And that childlike faith is gonna get me through the difficult times and I'm gonna learn to walk by that childlike faith instead of trusting what I see in a world where it is so easy to be deceived. Here's how I learned this. When I was a little kid, I was nine years old, I got a magic set for Christmas for my grandmother. It's not what I asked for for Christmas that year. It's the only thing I remember getting that year. I was nine years old, I get this box of magic tricks from my grandma, I open it up, I'm like, well, this is stupid. Uh, a box of magic tricks, I thought it was kind of dumb, right? And I, I didn't say that to my grandma, don't worry. I gave her a hug, I'm like, thanks for the magic tricks. Eventually go back home and I was sitting in my bedroom and I learned my very first trick with this little red ball. You put it inside of a cup and you make it disappear. And I'm like, no one's going to be fooled by this. And I go into the living room. I'm like, mom and dad, gather around. Here's what grandma got me for Christmas. And I put the ball in this vase and it disappears. And my parents, their chins drop, their eyes light up and they looked at me with awe and wonder. And it was the first time that I remember someone else looking at me with a look of awe and wonder in response to something that I had done. And immediately I thought I might do magic for the rest of my life. That was nine years old. Two years later, I was this kid right here. 
My very first photo shoot, 11 years old. <laughs> yeah, that's enough of that. Okay, uh, <laughs> that's awful. And I started growing up. Like, imagine, I was a little kid. Like, I was born with wonder. We all are. The wonder switch was in the on position. Well, then I started getting bullied and picked on and made fun of. I wasn't good at anything. I didn't have any friends in school. It crushed my wonder. But when I saw that look of wonder in my mom and dad's eyes, it reawakened wonder in me, and it made me begin to imagine possibility in a completely different life. So I set off on this mission to travel around the world doing magic shows. By 16, um, I'd performed on cruise ships. By 18, I'd performed in Europe and Asia, Canada, and the Caribbean. By 21, I made a million dollars. I'd performed on five continents and almost 30 countries uh, for over a million people alive in person. And all of that opportunity gave me the opportunity to like have cool stuff. Like I built a nice house in a nice neighborhood and parked two nice cars in my driveway. It was the American dream, right? Because that's what the world told me I was supposed to do. The problem is I went to bed every single night feeling totally empty, thinking like, is this what life is really all about? 5,000 times a day, I'm told, just buy this, drive this, wear this, do this. It's going to make your life awesome. For some reason, life doesn't feel so awesome. No matter how much stuff I have or how many people ask for my autograph or how many people want to take their picture with me, it just doesn't feel like it's enough. And that's when I began to realize that the magician, the illusionist, the supposed expert in the art of deception, that somewhere along the way I had been tricked and deceived myself. And I had settled for counterfeit versions of life from the illusions offered to me by the world. Well, at the height of my cynicism, I was 30 years old, traveling the world doing magic shows, experiencing the wonders of the world, opportunities provided to me by my ability to make people wonder. It's an ironic story, really. I mean, imagine I've stood at the edge of the Grand Canyon multiple times, the edge of Niagara Falls multiple times, the wonders of the world. I've seen the Taj Mahal, I've walked the Great Wall of China, I've seen the pyramids in Egypt three times on tours throughout the Middle East. The first time I saw the pyramids, I was like, wow. It, it's a, there's a reason why it was a wonder of the world. The second time I saw the pyramids, I was just like, how? <laughs> how did they do that? The third time I saw the pyramids, I was like, ah, cool, there's the pyramids. Been there, done that. It's just the pyramids. I started to develop this like apathetic, cynical outlook on life because I thought I'd experienced all the magic the world had to offer me. And again, I was doing magic. I was jumping in tanks of water wearing straight jackets. And when I would escape successfully after holding my breath for four minutes, I would come out of that tank and people's eyes would be wide in wonder. I would walk across burning hot coals and broken shards of glass barefoot. I would do fire eating acts and fire breathing acts like this, like blowing a giant ball of fire out of my mouth. That's something I'd done hundreds of times successfully. Well, a few years ago at a 4th of July event, I made a really stupid mistake. And then this happened. I was just second degree burns all over my face. I made a really stupid mistake and accidentally set my face on fire for only about eight seconds, but it hurt really bad. And I had no shows for a few weeks, obviously, while my face healed up. And I remember laying on my couch and that's when I started asking myself, like, why do you do this stuff? Why do you jump in tanks of water in restraints like straight jackets or chains? Why do you breathe fire out of your mouth? And that's when I realized that I'd forgotten why I do magic, that somewhere along the way, in seeing the wonders of the world, wonder had died in me, and I stopped believing that anything was real. Well, thankfully, around that same season of time that I set my face on fire, this had happened. It's a picture of my wife, Kate, right after she gave birth to my son, Jude. When I burned my face, Jude was about six months old. He looked about like this at the time. I know, right? Here's a picture of what Jude looked like really excited. Just for fun, here's Jude taking a selfie. <laughs> we just celebrated Jude's four-year-old birthday a couple months ago. This is close to what he looks like today. When Jude was a year and a half, this little girl came along. Her name's Everly, Nariah, which means Lamp of God. And she is. This is my whole family back home in Nashville. That's why people stop following me on Instagram. When you have kids like this, that's just all you post, right? But. I am so in love with them and they changed my life because before, before my cynicism robbed my kids of the wonder and the real magic that is in and through all of God's creation, including themselves, God used me becoming a dad and my little kids to reawaken wonder in my life and remind me why I do magic. 
Now, as Jude started growing up, as he was six months old, I, I was watching them there on the couch, and I'm like, why, why do I do magic? And then I realized he was seeing magic everywhere. And it reminded me of an old quote that those who don't believe in magic will never see it. But Jude saw it because he was a little kid and wonder was still awake. And then we started doing things as he got older that I take for granted, that wonder and magic is found in the mundane things that we can do every day. It's not always the edge of the Grand Canyon. We would sit on my back deck and blow bubbles, and I just saw bubbles. They were just bubbles. I've been there and done that a thousand times. But I realized when I blew bubbles that even though I was seeing bubbles, the reason Jude was lighting up is because he wasn't seeing bubbles. He was experiencing magic. And that's when it hit me. It's ironic that people like you call people like me magicians, and you think that the stuff that I did up on stage today, you call it magic. It's not magic. They're just tricks. But that does not mean that magic isn't real. Again, it is in and through everything. Look, when I ask you to think of something magical in life that you can experience, a lot of people say like, yeah, like a waterfall, or I hiked Half Dome. I climbed to the top of Half Dome this summer, and people would think, yeah, like that's magical, and it was. Watching a sunrise or a sunset is magical. But what about you? Life itself is a miracle. It's hard to believe because it sounds like a Hallmark cliche, right? But what if it's true? I mean, God made those sunsets and those canyons and those waterfalls and mountains. He looked at it all at the beginning of time after he made it and he said, it's good. And then he made you and he made me created in his image and he looked at us and said, that other stuff's good, but this, you, you're really good. To paraphrase C.S. Lewis, he said, if you and I could see each other the way that God sees us, C.S. Lewis said that we would weep with wonder. Keeps happening as my kids get older. Now we get packages in the mail from places like Amazon. Anybody order way too much stuff off Amazon? (laughs) It's usually boring stuff, paper towels, toilet paper. Every now and then it's something really awesome that I save up for. A new gadget arrives and my phone tells me, hey, it's here. And I yell, Jude, Everly, come here. You got to check this out. You won't believe what dad just got. And I rip open the box and I take something cool out, like a new camera lens or something like that. And I'm like, look, what do they care about? The box. I see a piece of garbage. But when they look at that box, they see possibility. They see a train or a rocket ship or a car. What if you and I could see life like that? What if you stopped using your imagination to worry and start embracing childlike wonder and use your imagination to dream and create again? It would change everything. So I want to leave you guys with one final trick, and I'll be honest with you. It is the cheesiest trick in my entire repertoire, right? But I'm going to show it to you anyway. I took it out of my show when I was a teenager and all the way through my 20s because I was trying to be like a really cool magician. The reason why it felt so cheesy to me was that lying voice of cynicism that says, don't do that, that's childish. But as we discovered today, there's a difference between that and being childlike. So I'm gonna show you the first magic I ever experienced in hopes that it reminds you to believe in real magic and awakens wonder in your mind and your heart. The very first magic I ever experienced when I was a little kid was the magic of seeing snow. How many of you guys have seen snow here in San Diego? How many of you guys saw snow somewhere else really cold? Are you used to, okay. How many of you used to live somewhere else really cold and you got annoyed by snow because it was like really cold and you got to shovel it and scrape it? Yeah, okay, cool. But like it's just snow, right? When I was a little kid, get this, I did not get to see snow for the first five years of my life. Growing up in Tennessee, those first five years, it snowed twice in Tennessee during the first five years and we were south in Florida on vacation. I totally missed it. The only time I saw snow during those first five years was on TV and in the movies. And in the movies, it always snows on Christmas. And so as a naive five-year-old, that's when I was taught it was supposed to snow by the movies was on Christmas. And so imagine I'm five years old. I'm kneeled down next to my bed on my hands and knees or just my knees and I'm praying and I'm like, God, please let it snow. Please, please, please let us have a, uh, what's it called? Oh yeah. Yeah. A white Christmas. Let us have a white Christmas. I wake up the next morning. I realize it's Christmas morning. I jump out of bed, I sprint down the hallway of our house, I bust through the front door to look outside, and guess what? Yeah, there was no snow. (laughs) I didn't understand, I had childlike faith. I go back inside and I'm like, hey mama, it's Christmas, right? She's like, yeah baby, it's Christmas, why? I said, how come there's no snow yet? What's a white Christmas? And she told me later in life, she thought it was kind of cute, like, oh, he got fooled by the Christmas movies. He thinks it's supposed to snow on Christmas. She explains it's been really hot in Tennessee. I'm sorry you haven't seen snow, but maybe we should go visit grandma and grandpa's house in St. Louis next year. 
It was a magical house in my childhood. Same grandma who bought me the magic tricks. It snows a lot of Christmases up there. I was so excited to get to St. Louis. We got there on like December 21st, 22nd. I don't remember exactly which day it was. I just know the weather report said that Christmas, uh, that, that the snow was coming on Christmas Eve. And so Christmas Eve came. And I was down on my knees next to my bed, praying again, God, please let it snow. Please let us have a white Christmas. I wake up. I realize it's Christmas morning. I jump out of bed, remembering the weather report, sprinting down the hallway again. I bust through the front door to look outside. And there was still no snow. <laughs> I went back inside. <laughs> I was a little kid. I, I didn't understand, but I didn't give up hope. I still imagined that maybe it might be possible. And that night, I just started praying again. I didn't know what I was, supposed to, I was supposed to do. And so instead of kneeling down next to my bed, I remember going over next to this windowsill in the bedroom that I was sleeping in my grandma's house. And I got down on my knees again next to the window and put my little elbows up on the windowsill. And I remember clasping my hands and looking up at the stars in the sky. The only reason I remember this, there was this creepy bush that looked just like a person that always scared the crap out of me right outside the window. <laughs> and I remember always looking past that bush up at the stars going, okay, please. Please let it snow. Please let us have a white Christmas. I must have fallen asleep praying next to the window that night. The next morning, there was a knock on my door. It was my mom. And she said, Harris, wake up. I woke up. She came and leaned over and she said, look outside. I looked outside. I couldn't believe it. Finally, finally, it was snowing. I jumped up, I ran down the hallway again, and just before busting through the front door, I remember pausing and it's like a home video in my head. I remember seeing my hand reach on the doorknob, take a really deep breath, and turn the doorknob, and I inched it open. I looked out, and it was everywhere. I ran out in the front yard. I picked as much of that snow as I could up in my hands and my arms. I threw it as high in the air as I could. And I remember putting my arms out and spinning around. And I laughed, and I cried, and I realized I wasn't dressed yet. I did have some pajamas on, but I had bare feet. I was so excited, adrenaline was pumping. A few seconds later, I ran back inside really fast and I learned what you smart people already know. Snow, it's really cold, right? It doesn't mean much to us now. After all, we're all grown-ups. it's just snow. But I'm telling you guys, in the mind of a six-year-old boy, and that was real magic. Of course, I had to go back to Tennessee where, believe it or not, it wouldn't snow for a few more years. But I never stopped reliving that experience of seeing snow. I would go into the kitchen while my mom was cooking dinner and I would pick up these little napkins off the shelf and I would fold them up and rip them into tiny little pieces of paper and throw them up in the air. I got in trouble every now and then because there was a paper mess all over my house. But it was my way of reliving the miracle of snow. And in that tiny little house in the foothills of Tennessee, this is what I would do for my mom. It's about the same response I got out of her. <laughs> she, was, she wasn't that impressed. Uh, it's just a paper snowflake made out of a napkin, so I can imagine you're not impressed either. But in that moment, my mom pulled up a chair at the kitchen table next to me, and she taught me what I, I really think must be the first lesson I remember learning from my childhood that I still remember today, and it's what I want to leave you guys with this morning. I learned that day from my mom what made snow filled with so much real magic. I learned that part of it has to do with the snowflakes themselves, that snowflakes are perfectly unique. Uh, you guys know this. We've heard it all the time. It sounds cliche sometimes because we hear it so often. But snowflakes are perfectly unique. In school, we studied them under a microscope in a cold room. They were beautiful. We realized that no two snowflakes will ever fall out of the sky that will be exactly the same. But what my mom explained to me was that the beauty, the the magic of snow is not when you walk outside and see one little perfect, unique, beautiful snowflake falling down in the distance by itself. It's when you walk out and you see all these unique snowflakes combining their beauty, working together to create this orchestra of magic all around us. And it is the experience of that combined magic that awakens our hearts and even the most cynical minds to wonder. When it covers the trees and makes that peaceful blanket on the ground, we just look at it. We don't wonder how it's possible. We just go... Wow, that is beautiful. And the same thing that's true about snow makes our lives so much, so it's filled with so much magic. 
Like, of course we're all unique like snowflakes. The reason why that sounds cliche to us, we've heard it a million times, is because of what our culture celebrates. We celebrate our outward appearance and all the things that make our life super special. Of course you're unique and look different. There's no two people in this room that look exactly the same, but it's not just your eye color and your skin color and your hair color that makes your life magical. It's the uniqueness, the unique purpose that God perfectly molded and created you to live out. And then he gave you the talents. He gifted you with the abilities to live out that purpose. Listen, I don't care how old you are. If you are here in this moment still breathing, you're still here for a reason. And there is still purpose that God has for you to experience. But the magic, that magic of your purpose in your life is not found during the times that you're sitting by yourself at your house on the couch flipping through TV channels. It's not found during the times that your kids are sitting by themselves in the room playing video games. It's certainly not discovered by me when I'm playing with this seemingly magical device on my couch while there is real magic playing on the living room floor at my feet. It's when I say, you know what, I don't wanna be distracted by that. It's when I, I look up and pay attention to the magic that God has placed all around me. It's when I take those uniqueness, those unique abilities, and when we all take our abilities and we start to work together as a team, combining our unique talents and purposes as a church, as a community, that's when real magic starts to happen. Even when I was a little kid, I realized that real snow was made out of water and that real snowflakes were much smaller than this one. But when I was a little kid getting bullied and picked on and made fun of and being called weird, I felt very small. One day I discovered the truth, the truth that would set me free, that they were right. I am super weird. <laughs> but it's just because I'm unique. And God gave me these unique talents and abilities and a purpose to live out. There are gifts from God. What you and I decide to do with these unique gifts is our gift back to God and our expression of worship to Him as our Creator. And if I took these unique talents and used them to honor and glorify Him instead of myself, well, if I could do that, if you could do that, if we could all leave here and do that together, magic, real magic might start to happen. Wonder would be reawakened across our land and people would develop a childlike faith in a God with whom anything, anything is possible. God bless you guys. Merry Christmas. Did you have fun in church this morning? Yes? Good. This really is one of the most magical times of the year. Can we pray? Let's pray before our final song. Bow your head, close your eyes. God, thank you so much for this moment in time with this group of people. God, I believe there's no such thing as a coincidence that someone stumbled into this church service this morning. And God, maybe they came because they heard of a magician who's here or a friend invited them to church and told them, trust me, it won't be anything weird. And maybe this morning ended up being a little bit weird. And that's okay. But God, we're all, we're all a little bit weird because you created us to be unique for your honor and for your purpose. So help us not waste this air that we're breathing right now. And God, as we, as we leave this place and go into the holiday season and all the meals and celebrations and traditions and even the exchanging of gifts, I pray that you would help us to remember to pause and to just stop and be still and to wonder. To take a moment or maybe even multiple moments over this holiday season amidst all the craziness to just pause and marvel at the gift of Jesus and how truly magical that is. 
that he will help us to realize that the only hope of living the life that you created us to live out is in relationship with you through your son, Jesus. Help us remember that's what Christmas is all about, the time that you offered yourself to us and that little baby boy, that Jesus, that grew up to live the perfect life that we could never live and died on a cross in our place and rose from the dead so that we might have life. So help us to not waste that life. Help us to be the human beings that you created us to be, to have a childlike faith in you and to remember that magic is real and therefore anything is possible. We ask all of these things in your name, in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. 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 God bless you guys. Thanks so much.